I don't know who I'm writing this to or why. It's the end of the world after all, so everybody knows all I have to say anyway. But somehow, I feel that I have to tell this to someone. So, it began as slight jolts from under the ground. Nobody really paid attention to them, especially in seismically active regions. People thought these were just minor earthquakes. They talked about them in the news, but only few actually cared. My parents, I was only 12 back then, were among those who did, but let's save it for later. In just a year, the jolts became much stronger and more frequent. In some areas, they turned into full-fledged earthquakes, doing a lot of damage to cities and villages. Worse still, previously dormant volcanoes began waking up. All over the world, people started raising alarm. Scientists talked a lot about climate change and impact of humankind, but it was obvious nobody really had any definitive answers. It didn't get any better either. As months went by, earthquakes and volcano eruptions gradually grew in power and frequency. At first, only one major natural disaster per month was reported. But in two more years, there were at least four of them occurring within the same period in every corner of the world. Even the normally calm regions suffered from quakes and resulting tsunamis. People tried to adapt, but it was all unfolding too fast for us to react adequately. All we had left to do was to learn to be always ready to move out from our homes and run. We stopped building big and sturdy apartment buildings, opting for lightweight 3D printed houses. They were easily destroyed but easily built too, which was a huge advantage. Items of luxury were rapidly losing their value, while on the other hand, mobile electronics and survival tools grew in price. People began really appreciating what they had and each other. Neighbors were helping one another, and whole towns unified their efforts to build strong communities and prepare for the worst together. And the worst came sooner than we expected. One day, the whole planet was shaken in one titanic earthquake. We thought it was the end for us all, because the ground went on shaking for hours and didn't cease until the next day. And then came reports from the Atlantic coast. The ocean receded leaving vast swaths of naked sand and corals. Research teams on helicopters went to learn what caused this cataclysm and found the unthinkable. There was an enormous whirlpool in the middle of the Atlantic, hundreds of times bigger than the largest sinkhole in the world. The water from the ocean was gushing down the gigantic drain, as if someone pulled the plug on the bottom. In a sense, that was exactly what happened. Tectonic plates beneath the Atlantic came apart forming a huge gap in the bottom. Boiling magma poured out, but was extinguished by the overwhelming mass of water, which then rushed down into the abyss. It went away so quickly that the overall water level fell in a matter of hours. The event was dubbed the Great Atlantic Rift, but it was still only the beginning. With the rising frequency of earthquakes and eruptions, wind patterns around the world changed, resulting in massive hurricanes. It seemed the whole planet was against its inhabitants. But like I said earlier, my parents were the ones who cared, and they had to know the reason. They were geologists at the International Space Agency, which continued its work even through all the cataclysms. And it was them who came to the distressing conclusion. For some unknown reason, the Earth had started to grow in size. It would explain everything. The ever more frequent earthquakes were caused by tectonic plates come into motion. The flowing magma was pushed from the mantle up towards the crust and burst onto the surface in places suited exactly for that – volcanoes. And that meant there would be other events like the Great Atlantic Rift, only even more catastrophic. After another year, we moved to live in the agency, along with the families of other employees and research workers. The buildings were made to withstand almost anything, so we were protected from the horrors of the outside. We took in as many people as we could, but of course, it wasn't nearly enough. Millions more were left to their own devices, and we could only hope that everyone was safe. By that time, as scientists estimated, the planet had already grown one and a half times its original size, and by the looks of it, the rate at which it ballooned was growing. In another year of our bunkered life, 
we witnessed it grow twice again. Rifts even bigger than the one in the Atlantic popped up in different parts of the world, causing widespread chaos. Everyone went to live underground where it was relatively safe. Communications between continents were all but lost, and all we learned about the situation above was from daring expeditions by scientists. The planet was ravaged by quakes, volcanic eruptions, tsunamis, and hurricanes happening almost daily now. Life on the surface was virtually impossible. It was then that the joint team of researchers and engineers suddenly came out with the solution they'd been working on for the last five years. They called it the Ark. It turned out several teams agreed to build huge spaceships to evacuate humankind, along with the surviving animal, fish, and insect species, in case the Earth comes apart. And the time they'd feared finally came. Everyone in the agency's buildings, including me and my parents, were escorted to an enormous hall where one of the arcs was kept. All other people from the continent who managed to come were also there. We were given personal IDs and then allowed to board. Each person was allocated a separate capsule that was to keep us hibernating for the whole time of space travel. We were told we were the colonists, the pioneers in space settlement. We were going to Mars. And that's how I ended up here, where I'm writing all this. We successfully boarded the Ark and were put to sleep in our capsules. When I woke up, we were already landing. I won't bore you with the details of terraforming and settling in our new home. At first, we all wore special suits equipped with oxygen tanks. But soon enough, we built a dome with artificial atmosphere and started making the territory suitable for living, both for us and for the animals we brought. Since then, 10 years have passed already. We're feeling almost at home on the red planet, which isn't really red anymore. There are lush forests and big cities sprawling all around. Mars is inactive, so there are no earthquakes or hurricanes here. Life is pretty peaceful. Although it's as busy as can be, with all the work that still has to be done. But all this time, we've all been anxiously watching our home planet grow in size. At first, it was barely visible in the night sky. But as months passed, it became more and more apparent until one day, it could be viewed in some detail with an unaided eye. Today, it's the size of the moon in our skies and visible even in the light of day. The sun is much smaller from here than it was seen from Earth. So basically, our home planet is now larger than its star. Through telescopes, we can see its surface covered in scars and fissures dozens of times bigger than the Grand Canyon. There are no more seas and oceans, and continents drifted far apart. The once green and blue and welcoming world is now a barren wasteland, boiling with fire and brimstone. The sun isn't helping it either. When the planet was small, the star bathed it in its light and warmth, giving it life and energy. Now, when Earth is a hundred times larger, the sun is scorching its surface and burning off the remnants of its atmosphere. But even that's not all. With the size, the gravity has grown too. Being so big and massive, Earth has collided with the Moon, virtually eating it up. Venus, which was similar to the previous Earth, started to be tugged toward the suddenly grown planet and was soon to run into it as well. And Earth itself is slowly gravitating toward the Sun. Scientists say that one day, it would first consume both Venus and Mercury and then get burned completely in the sun's heat. Wow. All I can hope now is to never see it with my own eyes. Okay, imagine there's a huge hot ball hidden inside the Earth. It's floating in an ocean of molten metal. This ball also spins on its axis, but it moves faster than the rest of our planet. This is what the Earth's core looks like. The solid metal ball is the inner core, and it's 750 miles thick. That's roughly the distance between New York and Chicago, and the whole thing is made up of hot iron and nickel. The outer core is the molten ocean. To reach the edge of it, you'd need to dig a tunnel into the Earth that was about 3,700 miles long. But you would hardly want to go there because it's the hottest point on the planet. The core temperature is 11,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That's greater than the surface temperature of the Sun. Another incredible thing about this place, the gravity at the outer core is three times stronger than that at the Earth's surface. This means that 
If we could somehow find a way to live near the core and you threw a stone there, it would fall three times faster than normal. It would become three times heavier. You would also become three times heavier. Now that doesn't bother you so much because things far worse will soon happen. Living conditions in the core would be the exact opposite of life on the International Space Station, and it'd be a lot harder than living on the surface. It would be difficult for you to even hold a fork in your hand because of just how heavy it would feel. Eating lunch would become a serious challenge. You'd break into a sweat just from writing with a pen on paper or typing on a computer. But if people could ever get used to these conditions, they'd become a lot stronger. Humans have learned to use the heat coming from inside the Earth as a source of energy. Some companies use this energy to heat water, which creates steam. This steam is used to power turbines that produce electricity. If the core ever cooled down and that heat disappeared, this kind of electricity might become very expensive. Some parts of Earth might become very dark, as people went back to using candles and fires to light things up at night. And you could forget about using your electric car as well, because charging it up would be just too much money. Phones, computers, the internet, all these things would cost a lot more. But this would actually be the least of our worries. Oh, just wait for it. The hot core's rotation creates the Earth's magnetic field. This field is like a shield that protects us from the sun and outer space. If the shield disappears, solar and cosmic radiation would pass through the atmosphere. The electricity supply would become seriously unstable. Microwaves, televisions, kettles, traffic lights, and computers could all be damaged. The screen of your laptop or phone would turn on and off randomly. Videos could freeze, and the batteries could run out in a second. Satellites would stop working, which means there wouldn't be any GPS system to rely on anymore. Say goodbye to navigating with your phone's map. Radio equipment would also stop working, so you wouldn't be able to make calls or send messages. Even now, when our magnetic field is working normally, solar flares can still create magnetic storms that disrupt electronics and affect people's health. Some people are sensitive to these storms and can get really bad headaches. If the magnetic field disappeared completely, every person on the planet, along with plenty of animals, would get seriously painful migraines. Scientists would have to invent special helmets that protect people from exposure to the magnetic storms. If the core cooled down and you became lost in a forest, it would be really difficult for you to find your way home even with simple equipment. Without the magnetic field created by the active core, your compass needle would no longer show where north, south, east, and west were. You would see the birds in the sky going crazy. They wouldn't know what direction to fly in for the winter, because south would no longer exist. In fact, no animal would be able to migrate anymore. In the sky, the location devices on planes would stop working. That means no more air travel until people find a new way to navigate. But hey, let's look on the bright side, because that's what we do here. You wouldn't have to go to the North Pole to see the northern lights anymore. Auroras would appear in the night sky everywhere. These occur because charged solar particles run into the magnetic lines stretching from north to south. But these lines will disappear if the Earth's core cools down, and the particles will light up the sky all over the world. A frozen core also means the tectonic plates will stop moving. There will be no more earthquakes anywhere in the world. But that's not as good as it sounds. The movement of these plates creates faults on the Earth's surface. They give us access to important minerals. With no more movement, producing fuel could become a lot harder. The price of gas might go up. Most people would have to stop driving their cars. There would be a lot more bikes and horses on the road. Maybe some llamas. Volcanoes would also stop erupting. If the core cools, the magma cools. People who live near large active volcanoes would no longer need to worry so much. But there would be a downside to this. Volcanoes contain a huge amount of useful substances and minerals. The soil around volcanoes is very fertile, which is really good for agriculture. So more people would now have to eat artificially created food. There would be big problems with the supply of natural food products. Only rich people might be able to afford that classic tomato and cucumber sandwich. But the worst thing would be the long-term exposure to radiation, which is seriously bad for our health. More radiation means that the risk of getting diseases would be much higher. People would have to build special shielding to protect themselves from solar radiation. 
it would be way too expensive to cover the whole planet with this technology. So we just create separate shields for each city. Just imagine the side of every city covered by a huge protective dome. In this radioactive world, movement between cities would only be possible in special closed transport. People would need to wear protective suits. You wouldn't be able to go to the countryside anymore. Anyone still living in a village or a small town without much funding would be forced to live underground to protect themselves. Plants and animals would also have problems. Herbs, flowers, and trees would receive huge doses of radiation and wouldn't be able to bloom. Livestock wouldn't be able to eat grass and hay. Milk, cheese, and yogurt would be in real short supply. Plants would have trouble producing oxygen. The magnetic field not only protects us, it protects our atmosphere. A frozen core and no magnetic shield means that the solar wind would destroy the atmosphere in a few hundred years. The conditions on Earth would be changed completely. Humanity would no longer venture outside its protective domes with their artificial atmosphere. Instead, we'd have not only our cities, but also the last surviving pieces of nature – our trees, lakes, grass, meadows, and flowers. Everything left outside the domes would turn into a scorched desert. This is what happened to Mars. The red planet has no seas, oceans, and lakes. Some scientists believe it's completely dry because its magnetic field disappeared. With no protection, Mars lost most of its atmosphere, and the sun's wind swept away all the surface water. But of course, this is just one of many theories. This took place billions of years ago, and no one can say exactly what happened. But don't worry, our planet won't turn into Mars anytime soon. The Earth's core is cooling very slowly. It will take another 2 billion years or so before it cools down completely. What's weird, though, is that our magnetic field can be unstable even today. In the southern hemisphere, there's a spot where the magnetic field is weak. This place is called the South Atlantic Anomaly. Charged solar particles flow through this spot, which can cause problems for orbiting satellites as they pass through. There are some other places like this around the world, but fortunately, they don't cause us any really big problems. Good thing. Not so long ago, astronomers discovered a planet that got the name of UCF 1.01. This world is about 33 light-years away from Earth. This makes the planet our next-door neighbor, in the cosmic scheme of things, of course. Honestly speaking, the space body is only a planet candidate because astronomers haven't measured its mass yet. But they have high hopes. The wannabe planet is very different from our Earth. Just 1.7 million miles away from its star, it completes its orbit in a day and a half. It's a scorching, deserted world with the temperatures at the surface rising up to 1,000 degrees. Even more astounding, the entire planet is likely to be covered in magma. Even if UCF 10-whatever ever had an atmosphere, It has definitely boiled away by now. But then, the question is, what if Earth once went through some catastrophic event and it left our planet in the same state, boiling hot with the surface covered by a thick layer of lava? Would people manage to adapt to such conditions and move to live underground? It sounds unbelievable, but experts are sure that with time, humans would turn into healthy and rather happy mole people. Of course, life would be very different than today. No more sunsets and sunrises. No more traveling by plane and space exploration. Unless people found a way to launch a rocket from under the ground. No more picnics in the park or sunbathing at the seashore. People would have to build a vast network of underground tunnels that would connect major cities. The most likely transport in this new world would be silent high-speed trains and electric cars. After moving underground, people would have not only physical, but also psychological difficulties. In the beginning, their new home would be a dark, barren place, without fresh air and devoid of any color. To adapt to these tough living conditions, people would have to make some design changes. Greenhouses, well-lit parks with trees and illusions of the sky familiar scents and sounds. All this would help people to adjust to their new life. After living underground for several generations, 
people would start to look a bit different. Pale, because of the lack of sunlight, with sensitive large eyes adapted to dimmer lighting and more developed lungs. As for the very possibility of living underground, well, hear me out. You might imagine the Earth's depths as a huge mass of compressed solid rock. But the reality is different. This mass is heavily cracked. Water runs down the fractures and cracks in the planet's outer layer, the crust. Some of these streams reach the depth of many miles. In other words, subsurface Earth could probably support plant and animal life. If people lived underground, they wouldn't have a shortage of fresh water. Its reservoirs in the planet's interior contain 100 times more water than all the lakes, rivers, and swamps combined. Plus, this water trickles through the soil that acts as a purifier. But people would have to be super careful to keep the sources of water intact. Otherwise, the underground cities would get flooded and turn into giant water-filled traps. It would also be a great challenge to live without sunlight. Plants can't survive without the sun's ultraviolet light. It's absolutely necessary for photosynthesis because sunlight is used to get nutrients from carbon dioxide in water. One of the byproducts of this process is oxygen, the thing people can't live without. So no sunlight equals no plants equals no oxygen. Sunlight is also crucial for humans. For example, it helps your brain release serotonin, a hormone that boosts your mood and makes you feel focused and calm. Thanks to the ultraviolet B radiation in the sun's rays, your skin produces vitamin D. It's vital for a strong immune system and healthy bones, teeth, and muscles. That's why people would have to find a replacement for sunlight. Luckily, LED lamps that can give off UV wavelength could produce the light human bodies and plants crave so much. In the new underground world, there wouldn't be large sunlit fields. Instead, there would be sprawling greenhouses with LED lights shining from the ceiling. Special machines would feed plants and crops with recycled water rich in nutrients. In some areas, located in the narrow underground faults, people would use something like shipping containers instead of greenhouses. These containers would be packed with vertical rows of plants and blue and red LED bulbs. As for people, they would have to follow a vitamin D-rich diet. It mean eating a lot of egg yolks, cheese, fish, spinach, soybeans, and so on. If these foods weren't enough, vitamin D supplements would do the trick. Without daylight, people would have problems with their circadian rhythms that regulate sleep patterns. If you were isolated somewhere without a glimmer of light, you would easily sleep for 48 hours at a stretch. That's why people living under the Earth's surface would rely on artificial lights to control their internal clock. There wouldn't be any problems with electricity. It would be produced with the help of the Earth's inner heat. Such kind of energy is called geothermal, from the Greek words geo, earth, and therm, heat. It can be extracted from hot water and rocks. Like an onion, our planet is made up of several layers. The innermost part is a solid core around 1,500 miles across. Made of iron, it's surrounded by a scorching outer core. It's up to 1,400 miles thick and is mostly composed of liquid nickel and iron. The next layer is the mantle. Even though lots of people picture it as lava, the mantle is actually rock. But this rock is so hot that it flows, just like road tar. The temperature in the Earth's core is as high as 10,800 degrees Fahrenheit. That's almost 1,000 degrees more than at the sun's surface. The mantle is also blistering, from 7,000 degrees at the boundary with the core to 400 degrees in its outer parts. No wonder people wouldn't have any difficulties with transforming all this heat into electrical energy. But because the insides of our planet are insanely hot, people wouldn't be able to build cities too deep underground. All inhabitable areas would most likely stay closer to the surface. The Earth's outermost part, the crust, is like the shell of a hard-boiled egg. It's broken into gigantic blocks called tectonic plates. When two plates collide, mountains get formed and new rifts appear in the seafloor. They have different width, from 25 miles thick beneath the continents to 5 miles thick beneath the oceans. 
These blocks travel around, floating on the Earth's mantle, slowly, almost imperceptibly. It means underground cities would also move, but it would be next to impossible to notice these movements. Oh, by the way, people started to believe there might be another world inside our planet in the 17th century. The idea got the name of the hollow Earth theory. It claimed that half the planet was taken up by its surface weight. Below the surface, there was some empty space. A small sun hung at the very center of that cavity, creating a comfortable tropical environment on the inner side of Earth's surface. One could enter the Earth's interior through one of the openings near the South and North Poles. A race of advanced humans was believed to live inside the planet. They were peaceful and lived for centuries. Well, obviously not humans. They had unique technologies, for example, flying vehicles. And since the climate inside the planet was better than that on the surface, this race was much stronger and healthier. Even though this idea sounds like science fiction, several famous scientists supported it. Some people are still sure there's another world inside our planet. But if the Earth was hollow, it wouldn't have a magnetic field. And without a magnetic field, solar winds would rid our planet of its atmosphere in the blink of an eye. This would leave our green planet deserted and uninhabitable, like Mars is. The magnetic field on our planet exists thanks to the processes going on in its very much not hollow center. Liquid metals are constantly moving in the Earth's outer core, generating electric currents. When the planet rotates around its axis, the electric currents form a powerful magnetic field. The sunward side of the magnetosphere is as large as 10 Earth's radii. And the other side stretches out in a magneto tail that spreads for 200 times the Earth's radius.